Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Engaging Ideas, the Parsons TKO podcast, where we like to bring leaders and luminaries from across the mission-driven sector to share ideas and experiences with you uh, so you can get some insights, have some kindred spirits out there you might be able to relate to and not feel so alone and all that great work you're doing out there to make a difference in the world every day. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Carrie jones Waring who's currently serving as Vice President for Communications at the Health Foundation for Western and Central New York. Welcome, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me, Tony. I'm so glad to be here. I am delighted to dive into this episode with you. As everyone knows, we got a few questions we're going to get started with. I'm going to be taking copious notes so we can run down any of those rabbit holes that pop up during this conversation. And Carrie, can you tell us about what your team looks like and, you know, what your primary objectives are in terms of outreach and audience engagement at the foundation? Sure. So um, the Health Foundation for Western and Central New York is um, a grant-making organization, excuse me, that serves the Buffalo and Syracuse areas and the surrounding counties. So we serve 16 counties in New York. Hmm. Um, And we have a focus on um, improving the health of young children under five who have their lives impacted by poverty. We serve um, uh, organizations that are improving the lives of older adults. And we also work to build community health capacity. So building that strong network of community organizations in our area um, that serve the people whose lives we wanna improve. Uh, We do all of this through a lens of health equity. Like a lot of uh, organizations our size, we're a small but mighty communications team. We have a a total staff of 12 at the Health Foundation. We have a two-person communications team. So it's myself and our communications content manager who really works with me on developing a lot of the um, content that we use on our website and our social media channels. And we're kind of just a a two-person team Uh, that really is working together to tackle some of these communications objectives. We are, in terms of outreach, we're in a really interesting place with our organization right now because in early 2020, we, before the pandemic, we made a commitment to conducting our work through a lens of health equity specifically. So we've kind of always been in these areas. We have served the community for 20 years. And it was kind of we like we were doing this work, but we weren't specifically calling out how racial and socioeconomic health disparities have an impact on health outcomes. So uh, we made the decision as an organization to um, develop a new strategic plan and a new vision statement um, that specifically centered our work in health equity. So from a communication standpoint, that really um, gave us an opportunity to take a close look at how are we reaching people? You know, what is the public image that we're projecting? And does it align with that vision? And does it align with our goals and equity? Philanthropy can be a little bit of an ivory tower. It has been traditionally where being in the position to distribute money is a very specific power balance, right? And it was a power imbalance that I don't think was really recognized too explicitly by this sector for a long time, but like a lot of foundations now are starting to realize sort of the role that we play in the community and how the work that we do either, you know, reinforces inequity or gives us the opportunity to kind of turn those things on its head and actually advance uh, racial health equity in the community. So we've been taking a really close look at our communications over the last couple of years and saying, you know, are we reaching the communities that we want to reach? Um, are we kind of using our position to undo some of those power dynamics and put ourselves in a position to be able to work with maybe grassroots organizations that serve the community that haven't had the opportunity to access philanthropic funds before? It's been a really interesting learning experience. And you said you started this work at the beginning of 2020. You know, and yes, amen on all your thoughts there about the philanthropy. I know there's there's just been a massive amount of talks, more so this year than I've heard in other years, about what role philanthropy really does have to play and what changes they might need to make, you know, in getting to these this equitable world we're all trying to achieve here. What's it been like in the two years of your practice then going through this? And because one thing 
I've been in conversations with and I hear about is how much of it was lip service and who's backsliding and how do we keep philanthropy and other organizations accountable for this work that they've committed to, um, to making sure they're, they're moving it forward rather than just slipping back into old ways. Yes. What's your, what's your experience been like over the last uh, two years? It's such a great question. And we started this work, as you can imagine, at a really interesting time to start it. Hmm. It was, we actually voted on this vision March 11th, 2020. So literally <laughs> days before wow. the pandemic really came to the U.S. And, and things started to change. And of course, just a few months before the um, racial justice reckoning that happened in this, or that started to happen in this country in May 2020, so we were really cognizant of the fact that this could easily look like lip service. It could easily become lip service. And what we did was we started as an organization by having some really candid conversations with some folks in the community that we trusted who specialize in this kind of work and, and said, you know, what's the door into this? Like, how do you even start this work? Because it feels so overwhelming. And they said, look within don't do anything until you look within this organization and make sure that your day-to-day -day work is not reinforcing some of these social structures and some of this inequity so we started a really detailed process of reviewing everything we do as an organization we looked at our application our grant application we looked at our reporting processes and when i say looked at we are looking at this is ongoing work it's really slow it can feel slow because it's so important you feel this urgency so it can feel very slow but every incremental step is really important so we've been looking at the way we interact with our grantees and the communications aspect is really interesting because i think a lot of us in the field probably feel like I'm doing a pretty good job with this. You know, I, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm using the right terminology and I'm staying up to date on what, you know, inclusive language looks like. And when you start to really dig into it, we had a lot that we could have been doing differently. Um, we have been sort of reviewing all of our practices and communications. And you start by saying, well, we got to make sure we're using the right words and, um, is you know we're using alt text in our images and that's all important stuff too but then you really start to think about how are we framing the issues that we're talking about how are we bringing to the community what it is that we're trying to do in a way that is respectful and um, recognizes the dignity and the humanity of the people that we're serving so it's really been requiring kind of a holistic audit of everything that we were doing and the way we talk about our work one um, aspect that's been really important to us is the concept of asset framing, which is um, a concept developed by Travian Shorters, who oh, yeah. is a, a really uh, just amazing speaker. And uh, I think he refers to himself as a social entrepreneur, which is such a cool way of putting it. Um, and he developed this idea of asset framing, which is so people are worth more than the challenges that surround them. So it's the idea that uh, another way that I've heard it put is people have worth and dignity even before the nonprofit shows up. So talking about your work in a way that recognizes the humanity and the dignity of the people that you're serving. And um, another concept that we've really been, that has been sort of the center of the work that we've done in communications over the last couple of years is a systemic lens to every single thing that we do. So, for example, we have this amazing doula program that we fund in central New York and in western New York. And what that does is provide doulas, birthing doulas, for people who are having babies mm -hmm. uh, at no cost. And normally a doula is extremely expensive. Right. You know, someone like myself with some financial privilege, when I had my kids, I couldn't afford a doula. It was wild how much they cost. So, and with good reason, because they provide a really incredible service. And doulas have been shown to reduce the likelihood of um, complications during birth and after birth for both the mother and the child. So it's a really incredible service. But when we talk about our doula program, just using that as an example, we need to talk about the amazing work those doulas are doing and that the organization is doing. But we also need to talk about the fact of why they exist. Why does that program have to exist? 
because we have a healthcare system that doesn't serve everybody equally, because we have a for-profit healthcare system in this country, and some people have access to super high quality services and some people don't. So these doulas are doing amazing work in, in this small space, but really the bigger issue is the systems level change that has to happen. So that's sort of been our guiding light over the last couple of years is reframing the way we talk about our work and pointing toward those systemic issues that the Health Foundation might not be able to change on our own, but if we keep calling attention to them, it's gonna have a cumulative effect. Yeah, thank you for that. And just uh, with some of the things you were saying there, the feel slow part, it's like, it's got to take the time it's going to take as long as action is being made. I, it's almost like I think we have to change something in the thinking in the nonprofit sector, or maybe just society. Everyone just got so used to this super fast, instant, everything's going to be on. Oh, look, I flipped the switch. This app works and I've got a thousand followers type of mentality. And this is work that has to take the time it's going to take, but it has to keep happening. Um, and I love that where you're at too, is we have to start. How do we start? And we find that in a lot of our work, you know, whether it's helping people on technology road mapping or any of the data work, it's like, there's just so many places you could dive in and there's so much to it where to start and helping people figure out that starting point always feels like the right approach. Like if I want to get back in shape, I really want to run this race, but I haven't been off the couch in months. Just take a walk. Just take a walk and just get the habit of the walk. It feels like that. So yeah. I, just, just to reinforce that for everyone, this isn't going to happen overnight. This isn't going to happen, in, but you have to start. That's right. One of the uh, folks that we've been working with in, in our DEI kind of training calls it um, urgent lifelong work. So you feel that urgency because you want to help people immediately, but it's lifelong work. And part of that is maybe just the the systems that we work in are very results oriented. Like <laughs> it's a very um, for-profit kind of mindset in a lot of nonprofits. What are the deliverables, that kind of thing. You can't have that mindset with this work because there's never a finish line. There's just never a finish line. You, it's, you're going to be continuing to work on this stuff as long as you're in this space. So once you realize that, you can come down a little bit and really start working on it. Well, it makes itself so open. If you really just think in terms of processes, like coming out of software development years ago, but the agile methodologies where there isn't a finish line, but you, you, sh you need marks and points in time to see how well you did. And then to be able to adjust, like it's also not a three year throughput plan. You have a three year trajectory of where you want to go and you know the first six months because they're right in front of you. You don't know the last six months of that three and you, you're going to get there eventually, but you want to adapt along the way, not just stick to what was written on a Word doc uh, yeah. in the boardroom. I'm curious, um, when you started this work and then you were signing off on it, March 11th, 2020, right before everything really started to change globally, who, where, where did the idea for it stem from? Was it just an, a realization of the work you were doing locally and that something felt off or was there a specific board member or staff person who brought it up? Yeah, we had, so it was driven by our board. And so every five years we go through a strategic planning process. Hmm. And so it was time for that process to begin. And we had some really incredible dynamic board members, uh, trustees, who started to talk about, you know, if we're doing this work, we've always been in this space, but until we call out the fact that race and socioeconomic status have an impact on your health and we need to undo that, what are we doing here? Like it, it almost became an imperative. I'm going to be very frank without getting into, you know, I can't share any, you know, proprietary information or anything, but there were some really complex conversations that had to happen. And I will also give the disclaimer that I was, I joined the organization just as I joined the organization in August, 2019. So just a few months before they made the decision. So they were already in the strategic planning process, but um, you know, there were some really complicated conversations, hard conversations that had to happen because again, going back to philanthropy as a white dominant sort of ivory tower situation, for a lot of folks, this was a new way of thinking and new information, but everybody, um, and through those complex conversations came to the realization that, yeah, this is something that we have to do. So as part of that sort of five-year strategic planning, they said, 
it's an evolution, not a revolution. So it's, we didn't completely flip everything that we were doing in terms of our work. It was more of a, let's put a finer focus on it to really use our platform to call out these disparities. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I hope that for anyone who's working and trying to work through these things internally and hasn't really set out to start making progress on it, like here's some ideas on how to get started or what was the impetus or how to get yourself moving forward. Uh, thanks for bringing up Trey being shorter too. Those work is credible. We're definitely going to link to him. And I had the great pleasure of being in a, um, uh, committee once uh, for a conference with his wife, Yetunda Shorters, who also runs an incredible business. So we'll link to both of them in our show notes so everyone can check out all the great work um, that they're both doing in this world. So there's two of you in the team. So first of all, just for everyone listening, just to reemphasize that, two, two folks, a lot of work, lots happening, and in the midst of change and absorbing all of it. Um, I guess because we did touch a little bit on measurement uh, just a second or two ago, but how do you deploy analytics or data in your work and how does that come to fruition? How do you use it? So great question. So on the communication side, we we do a typical kind of analytics in terms of looking at our website visitors and our engagement on social. Um, what we'd like to do going forward is, is more um, drawing the connection between the communications work and sort of the holistic overall organizational work to say, you know, the work that we're doing in communications is helping us reach new organizations who may have not found us before. There's something to be said for um, your feedback loop that you sometimes get to in communications where it's like you're reaching your network really effectively, but who's not in that network? So that's one of the things that we've been really looking at through this equity work is, you know, how do we identify the people that just aren't in those circles and how do we reach them and how do we create a sense of trust with folks who may not have been able to work with philanthropy before. So, you know, that's a hard line to draw. It's hard sometimes to make the connection between, oh, we, you know, we ran a PSA on a different radio station than we usually do. And so we've been able to reach X number of people. So a lot of work in philanthropy is nebulous to start with. And in communications, it can really be that way too. Um, for our organization as a whole, there's a lot of uh, imperative in philanthropy sometimes to get that ROI, right? We want to see, going back to that idea of like a business kind of mindset, we want to see return on our investment. Um, and so our organization has been taking part in something called the Equitable Evaluation Initiative, which is the national cohort of foundations who are working in these types of spaces to come together and have conversations about how our desire for return on investment or traditional approaches to evaluation may sometimes be reinforcing inequity. Because what is happening is you have this idea that you know, you need to report on everything. Every grant you give, you should be analyzing, you know, how many people did you reach? How many people did you serve? But what that often does is create an onus on the grantee partner who is probably a tiny organization, a nonprofit that has a staff of three sometimes. And even the well-staffed, well-financed organizations, they don't have extra time. They don't have extra resources. They are living day to day trying to keep the doors open and keep people served. And here we come with a $25,000 grant and saying, I need quarterly reporting on all of these objectives, you know, um, that we need to start recognizing what we're doing to these organizations. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't evaluate your work. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, you can't get an ROI measurement. It means what do those terms mean to you? And how can you as the um, person on one side of a power imbalance that has more resources, how can you take that onus off of the grantee? So that's kind of how we've been starting to learn as an organization um, about how the kinds of data that we collect um, you know, how we can do that differently. I had a podcast at least with Rachel Kimber, uh, who's now at Smile Train. And we were 
she was talking a bit about uh, the reporting side too, and grant making and alternative reporting and oral reporting um, mm -hmm. as, a, as some new methods being looked at to really try to take some of the burden off the grantee uh, and then get that information that the grant maker still wants, but like way easier with less time getting invested by the grantee so they can get out there doing their work instead of <laughs> sitting around exactly. just typing out reports and hoping it's the right thing and then being really nervous and all the things that goes with that, right? Exactly. You know, once you recognize that power dynamic, you start to see it happening everywhere where you don't even think about, you know, the fact that a grantee is in a position where they're thinking, I need this funding to survive. I'll do whatever these folks need me to do. Well, then you're taking time away from what the work that they're actually trying to do. So we've been, we're in the very early stages of learning about this, but we recently, you know, added a field to our reporting process that allows for oral reports to be given, like a, a voice recording, um, stories. Um, one of the really important parts of the equitable evaluation initiative that we've been learning about is, you know, what do you consider data? And storytelling is data. So if you have the chance to hop on a Zoom with a grantee, they tell you about some of the work they've been doing, and you bring that back to your board, that's data, you know, like that's showing um, the impact of your investment and their work. So, you know, we really, it's just about a mindset shift, like all of this work. It's a mindset shift to say, you know, how do we measure whether we're successful? So, yeah, wholeheartedly. I mean, storytelling is data or data is storytelling. And it's, you know, yeah. the numbers alone mean nothing if there's no context around them. Exactly. Uh, and we've always emphasized qu quantitative matters and you want to be able to collect that, but it's the qualitative side of those two that, that really makes the story shine, you know, oh, we had a uh, hundred retweets or we had one retweet by Michelle Obama. I mean, there's exactly you know, that, uh, that qu quantitatively, that one would be very sad, right. uh, but qualitatively the impact of that is huge. And I, I think we still obscure or miss the opportunities because we're just trying to churn out reports that were it's so hard for nonprofits, a team of two, to really take the time to sit there once you get through churning that report and say, what did we really see? How do I package this? How do I tell the story behind it? And yeah. we'll just uh, if we could start to bring in a little bit of that, take a breath. It's not just the numbers, throw the story on it. And then right. and see the throughput of your story over time. Like you know, once you get to yeah. chapter 10, how what did chapter one look like? Did it really align as you went along? Exactly. Yeah. And social is such a, that's such a great example because it can be so frustrating to look at your, first of all, some of the like back channel analytics that they give you on something like Facebook are just so infuriating. Sometimes it's just so hard to parse even, you know, what some of those numbers mean. And, but it's a great point where I think a lot of people have kind of an old school idea of like what's successful on social and but you have to come to the understanding that maybe, like you said, somebody really influential shares your post, that might have more of an impact than getting a thousand likes, you know? So it really, you have to be able to look at the numbers, but then say, what does this really mean in terms of how we're actually reaching people? Yeah, I've never run into the nonprofit yet who said our goal is lots of numbers. Exactly. Like bigger, bigger numbers. Uh, you right. know, it's, it's all for creating affect in society or an impact or, or how to get there. And yeah. we just got to make sure we don't disconnect uh, those along the way. So so you've been at this for a little bit now, uh, team of two, uh, working a good two years into your, for solid two years. Uh, what issues of equity and inclusion have you run into with your outreach efforts? Um, and also any of the data collection and reporting that we were just talking about and how would you manage to address it if you did run into any, any sort of issues along those lines? Yeah, and, and I think to go back to the social issue, you know, one thing that we've run into is uh, it's difficult, it's really difficult to measure whether you are reaching the organizations and the communities that you want to reach if you're looking at something like social engagement, because oftentimes it's just a little bit, you just don't have that data um, on a more minute level to be able to may come to those conclusions. And I think that that's something that is a problem with the industry as a whole. So we don't do a lot of research ourselves, but we will often partner with an organization to fund some research. And one thing that we run into 
frequently is the idea of disaggregated data and, or the lack thereof, back channel, uh, back mapping, that's what it's called, back mapping, where you're actually, so you have some numbers, but do those numbers actually mean anything if you can't kind of go back to maybe the previous step that led to those outcomes? So the idea of back mapping is looking at, like, for example, if you look at maternal mortality numbers, um, they're abysmal across the board, across all races, but especially if you look at um, Black women and Black people who are giving birth and saying, well, those numbers are atrocious. So back mapping would then take you just to lead you to the next step, which would be, well, what led to that? Um, the, uh, you know, that more often than not, people of color are less insured, have less access to health care than white people. So when you start to do that back mapping, you actually get to the heart of those systemic issues that you're talking about. The problem is with any of this kind of level of data, a lot of folks don't have the resources and the time to actually dig in that further. And the foundational kind of data that we're pulling from, like for example, data from the State Department of Health, it's not disaggregated by race. So you'll often have like, it, it, it is at some points, but it largely, this is an issue that across the board we're dealing with where data is not disaggregated by race, income. And so we're kind of starting from a point where we're trying to draw conclusions from data that isn't even telling the full story. So when you're able to look at data that is broken down by, for instance, race or ethnicity or by socioeconomic status, then you can start to draw some of those back mapping conclusions. That's sort of the, the bigger picture and on a smaller scale, something that we're dealing with in communications as well, where it's like the data and the analytics that we're working with don't tell the full story. So that's our challenge for the coming year is to start to say, you know, how do we draw those connections between the kind of outreach that we're doing, you know, the news stations that we're pitching for stories um, is it all traditional media or is there some smaller community newspapers that we need to be reaching because those are where folks are getting their news? Social channels, are we, you know, in the right spaces for what we're trying to do? There's a lot of challenges and a lot of work that we still have to do in that area. It sounds to me a little bit like you're almost in a position where you have to start making your own unique data sets out of where you're able to compile from. Is that true? That is true, and I don't know that we have the ability or the resources to. Like, that's a huge undertaking. Oh, I mean, massive. that would be the ideal situation, right? But again, it's and, and again, working with some of these organizations that are two-person teams overall, you know, right. that just don't have a big team, don't have a lot of resources, but you know, are mission-driven and are moving in the right direction. But you know, how do we how do we tackle these huge data issues? Yeah. I mean, data normalization, being able to pull it in. And then if you were to create this data set and it was secured and anonymous enough and there wasn't any PII or any of the things we've got to think about with um, any of the, the health uh, requirements too on records, um, do we just, you know, HIPAA, can you get it back out then? You know, is there a way to share these once they're created? Does that become right. useful for other organizations to be able to build off of? Yeah, I don't know. I got very frustrated in the, probably maybe like a lot of people during COVID and just continuing to watch that the numbers couldn't get reported accurately out of any area, right. let, let alone the Fed doing nothing to step in to try to start normalizing it and saying, let's create a common data set. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> that idea of a common data set is, is across the board, something we need to be moving toward. We find it a lot with the smaller community organizations we work with they're collecting some data that's probably really valuable to other organizations, but they have no way of sharing it. So we have organizations like 211 locally who is, are doing amazing work in terms of that normalization of the data loop, like a community information exchange. So it's like, if you're part of this community information exchange, you can share your, like obviously disidentified data about, you know, someone, comes to you for your services, but they also need WIC. They also could really 
um, benefit from being in touch with social services or the food pantry, um, you can make those referral loops. There are a lot of people that have the right idea about it, but it's in the really early stages of moving that way. In those examples, I mean, just really locally to where you're at in the Buffalo area in Western New York, you know, there is still a lot of fear from certain groups about what happens if their data is collected. And a lot of times yeah. that people won't give data for those reasons. And, you know, it's, uh, and then if a smaller organization is collecting it, how are they treating it and handling it and making sure it's secure? Has there been any conversations uh, where you're at just in the community about, hey, this is what we could be doing or this is how we're doing it? Anything you've heard? To kind of overcome those yeah, trust issues? Probably the trust issues, one, and then two, just how people are handling data or securing it or where yeah. they're... Yeah. Oh, yeah, security. <laughs> um, I, I think people have really, they have good reason for it for being distrustful of sharing oh, their yeah. information, understandably. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's probably also part of, you know, our entire landscape and our entire world right now where you're always wondering, like, who is taking my data? Because there are a lot of bad actors. There's a lot of companies that are in the business of selling your data. So it's understandable that people would feel that way. So in terms of, you know, health outcomes, there definitely needs to be really clear communication around the fact that, you know, uh, this is for a greater good and that information is totally anonymized and disidentified and, and, and moving that way. I don't know of any specific organizations that are working on that aspect specifically. Um, I think probably just because so much of this work is in that really critical early stage of just getting organizations to sign on. And there's also uh, uh, like some competitiveness among nonprofits, you know, to say like, no, you shouldn't be going to them, you should come to us for help. And so there's a reluctance, I think, sometimes for folks to be part of the same network because ultimately they unfortunately feel this sense of competition, which goes back to the idea of like, why are we even putting organizations in this position in the first place who are providing these incredible services? So there's a there's interesting politics involved. Oh, yeah. I mean, the I forget what the phrase I heard coopetition, that it's competitive but cooperative exactly. in the nonprofit space. And everybody's trying to get a little bit of advantage because everyone, to earlier points, is just worried about that bit of money to make sure they can keep in existence and keep working. Um, there's okay. another a podcast episode we did with Jenna Sloten, who works on data values a lot in the international development space. And one thing she talked about was with um, data collection practices is also communicating back to the communities where the data has been collected, you know, yes. the feedbacks and this is how it's been used and look, this is what we did with it. And is there, have that's you seen anything true. like that emerging around you? Definitely a lot of conversations around that. And that's been a, a topic frequently in the equitable evaluation cohort that we're part of is um, building that trust and recognizing as an organization that when someone does give you that feedback or data or information about their lives, that is a value that they are providing to you as an organization. And you need to recognize that. Um, you definitely need to share back with the community what they found. You need to recognize that ultimately the community owns that information. This is not something, this is not your IP, right? This is um, the community's information. And one thing that we've been moving toward and a lot of other organizations are, is compensating people for their time mm. and their information. So if some, I mean, the idea is not new to give someone 50 bucks for participating in a focus group, but where it gets a little trickier is, you know, um, having, a grantee come and speak to your board or to the community that's time out of their day they provide a really valuable service in general but also in that situation and so you should assign a value to that as the person on the other side of that power imbalance right so we we, re we this is our 20th anniversary this year so we have been working on a video um, talking to some of our grantees and for the first time we compensated them for being interviewed for our video because yeah we're partners and we have a great relationship with them but at the end of the day they took time out of their busy day serving the community to come and talk about us so 
you know, that's travel time, it's time out of their work schedule. And uh, so we compensated them for that. And uh, so I think that um, there definitely is a movement toward understanding that if you're going to build that trust, they need to, the community needs to see what you're doing with the information that they're giving you. Important reminder too about the compensation, taking people's time. I hope folks listening are, are hearing that one too. And thank you for diving in on that with me. So one, one thing uh, you had mentioned to me that I'd like to hear a little more about too, is within your communications work and as you're taking a review of the equity in your communications, uh, equity style guide. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So that was a, a, a recommendation that came out of some of our internal, that internal review that we've been doing, uh, the looking looking within. And, you know, you hear, hear the term style guide and you might think of a P style guide. This is not that. This isn't your standard style guide. What this is, is really a formalization of our commitment to equity in our communications. So we're basically getting it on paper. You know, these are our principles when we talk about communications in our work. Um, these are some foundational kinds of ideas that will influence how we talk about our work. And so this was something that my colleague and our communications team and I sat down and put together over the course of a couple of months. We talked to our team members. We talked to some of our grantees. And we put together this basic, it's probably 10 pages. And what it does is, um, you know, formalizes our communications strategy with a lens of equity. So there are a lot of different components to it. There's, um, you know, word choices, terminology that we choose to, to use because there's a lot of complex conversations happening around how you talk about, you know, racial issues, gender and trans issues. And um, more specifically about health equity issues, you know, there's a, how do you define health equity? If you ask five people on the street, they might give you five different definitions. So we wanted to get it on paper so we could all come to agreement as an organization, not just the communications team, but the whole staff and the trustees to say, you know, we agree on this. And understanding that there's, you know, communications is an ever evolving thing and that things might change within the style guide, but some basic core principles about how we frame our work, that idea of asset framing, that idea of drawing attention to systemic issues. We really wanted to get that on paper so we could all come to agreement around it. And one aspect of it that I really, uh, as we were developing it, didn't realize, and shame on me, maybe for not doing so, how important it will be is the um, idea around accessibility in our communications. So, I mean, it's huge. And I don't think most people have even, the, I think, like I said earlier, everyone thinks they're doing a great job with it. And then when you start to dig into it, you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much more that we could be doing. Um, you know, always using alt text with your images, always using at least captions on your videos and your webinars. Um, you know, we've had a couple of real life examples where someone could not access our content because we didn't have captions turned on. And it was mortifying and I felt terrible for that person. And I'll never do that again. And um, I've been learning a lot about the different, like the value of captions versus an ASL interpreter and how an ASL interpreter is way more valuable for a deaf person in terms of getting context about what people are talking about in terms of accuracy, it's way more valuable. So, you know, that's something that we kind of formalize that we're always going to at least provide captions, if not an ASL interpreter. You know, it's really, it's been a really eye-opening experience. And a lot of our staff said the same. They said, I didn't even know we were supposed to be doing this. So, um, so that's kind of what the style guide is. It's really just uh, almost a policy document that says, this is our approach. This is really our strategy in communications. So those are some of my follow-up questions. So it's it, it's stored as a PDF or a document? and or... Right now it's a Google Doc. Okay. And we did that on purpose um, because we wanted it to be sort of a living document mm -hmm. and to understand that things might shift and things evolve. We might change our mind about things. So um, it's fully accessible for the whole staff. And uh, it's a living document. 
So that was some of my next questions was how often, I don't know how old or how long the document's been around, but how often would it be revisited and checked, uh, you know, audited? Like, where are we at? Is it still resonating? How often? Yeah. Has that happened or is that in the works? Uh, it's still pretty new. We released okay. it for the staff a couple of months ago, and we do want to also share it publicly. We're not quite there yet. we got to make a couple of revisions um, just in case any other organizations, you know, get any use out of it. Um, but we, uh, so we had, we're kind of still in the stage of putting a fine point on it. So there's actually some revisions that are happening right now, but I think it's something that we should be revisiting once a year at least, but really kind of always keeping in mind, you know, the idea that we should be listening to the community and um, revising it as needed, depending on how things evolve. There's been, um, we've had some really great conversations around you know, um, the cultural context for a lot of word choices and a lot of terminology and that, you know, our standard has always been to refer to older adults as older adults versus something like seniors. But there's a lot of communities, the Black community and um, Indigenous people who really um, value referring to older people as their elders. And that is a really meaningful term. And so we one of the components of the style guide is the idea that any of this could change based on you know cultural context and what you need the most important thing that you can do is to listen to the people that you're serving and be uh you know be mindful of their cultural context and how you might be more respectful of those ideas so it's if that's kind of the core principle in it is listen to the people you're serving I said more questions about this. The first time I've heard of it, so I'm really excited. And I hope everyone uh, listening is getting excited too. I was going to ask if you could share it. So it sounds like that, that's coming soon. And whenever you're ready, we'd love to post it up and get it out there for others to look at. So you had said it's open to all staff. Anyone can go in and edit? Because I can, I can hear some of the audience right now like, ah. <laughs> I know. Well, that's a great point. And I know that every organization is different. We are really privileged to have a, a small team, right. and B, a team where there's a ton of mutual respect for our different roles. So I have no qualms about it, leaving it open for editing because I trust every person on this team to do the right thing and to ultimately come to me with questions. Now, I feel like I'm really tuning my own horn here, and I don't mean for it to sound like that, but I do feel like the organization has created an environment where we can trust each other on that level. I totally get that a larger organization may not be able to do that, but um, that I think that at least it should be something that's open for discussion, even if not everybody has access to edit it. Uh, I mean, change moves at the speed of trust. And exactly. It, regardless the size of the organization, I mean, you have to find a way to democratize all of that, whether it's democratizing data for decision making across different units, or it's democratizing certainly the values of the organization out to the staff so everybody can internalize it and then be proponents of those values for the organization back to the communities we serve seems incredibly important. And yeah, toot away, toot your horn. This is this is your time. I think this is great. I mean, it's it is fantastic. And this is one of the reasons I really like doing the podcast is there's so many great ideas and so many examples all over. And the more we can share that into the community of, you know, traction can start to get gained and what you've built there could be applied in other places, just unique to their own situation or, you know, how they would set it up or what they would do. I really love that idea though, of that open document, because even in a super large organization, anyone could then log in and see it and see right see what the effort is and and see that there's action being made not just talk and you know back exactly. to how, back to how we started the episode right how do we if we're layers away in an organization from that central leadership group see that something's happening and i feel like having that open document is is one way to at least internally understand people are making intentions and movements and and trying their best exactly it's very operationalized it's you know it's not just talk is um how does this affect the way we actually do our day-to-day -day work so i've already had folks who you know it's just been a couple months but people will email me and say 
can I see the document? You know, I, I was going to use this word, but I think I should do this instead. So it's really, it's, it's been really helpful already. This is wonderful. I mean, this is a, a major highlight. I'm really glad we got in to talk about this. You know, we are, like I said, in the beginning, we are here cresting to the end of 2022. Um, and this will be coming out in early 2023. So with that in mind, in case anything drastically changes in the next three to six weeks, uh, everyone who's listening, take our, our thoughts here with a grain of salt about our future outlook. But you know, as we look out to getting things started here in 2023, I mean, what are three things you are focusing on or interested in learning about in the coming year, or getting excited about? So definitely the, like the continuation of our equity and communications work. So the style guide was kind of the first real concrete step for us. And the next step is doing a very specific audit of all of our assets. So looking at our website content, our social channels, um, our email copy, our media lists, you know, who we're reaching out to and um, looking through it and looking through it with a lens of is this accomplishing what we want to in terms of equity? And is there anything that we could be doing differently? Should we be on a different social channel? You know, some folks are using WhatsApp. Some folks are using TikTok um, to get their messages out. And I don't know if that's right for us, but we need to be examining whether it is. So that's the next step is doing um, kind of an audit, maybe an update of some of our visual assets, brand assets, um, to make sure that we are projecting an image that reflects our commitment to equity. Something that, I don't know, I guess I'm not excited about this, but something that I think is really important in the coming year, speaking of social channels, is kind of examining our place on social media and the role that social media is playing in some of these issues that we're trying to correct. And um, I know that a lot of folks have had a reckoning on Twitter over the last couple of weeks and months. And we had similar feelings about Facebook uh, during the election when there was a lot of misinformation that was being promoted via Facebook. And so, you know, I want to have some really hard conversations in terms of what's our role in that? You know, are we upholding something that we shouldn't be by having a presence on these channels? Can we accomplish our objectives without kind of playing a part in these systems that are kind of, you know, really uh, problematic? So um, that's something that I want to be part of kind of that equity review and to say, where should we be? Or can we use those platforms for good and to undo some of that impact that social, you know, different social media channels are having? To end on a brighter note than that, um, I, you know, we had an in-person gathering last week and it was really our first event back since the pandemic started. And of course, you know, we have to continue to be safe, but it was so energizing to be with people in the community again. And I'm really looking forward to the, like really looking at how we can take what we've learned from the past two years in terms of events or convenience and kind of meld them. So you still have that energizing in-person event, but still using virtual aspects that might be more accessible for people who maybe have health complications and still don't feel safe or are coming from different parts of the geography. You know, we serve 16 counties and we might have a convening in the city of Buffalo or the city of Syracuse. And we serve organizations that exist two to three hours away from that by car. And those folks were exclu excluded essentially from the before times style of an event, an, an in-person event. So, you know, how can we continue to rethink the way that we do community convenings and make sure they're accessible to everybody that we serve? Love it. I'm going to follow up on a couple of those too. So on the audit, um, it sounds like, a little bit of a content on it, maybe a little bit of data in the audience, like CRM type audit. Are you looking to do that internally or are you looking for someone to come in externally for that type of, you know, objective review coming in? Yeah, we're looking to, to work with someone externally. We're going to be doing a lot of 
the internal work sort of stewarding it. Mm -hmm. But we, um, you know, you have to know your limitations too. And I really have been looking at different comms firms that specialize in equity. So I don't want to just work with a great public relations or branding firm that does great dazzling campaign. That's great. There are a lot of firms right here in Buffalo that are doing fantastic work, but I need someone who gets it. Like I need someone who really understands uh, the ideas of equity and how that can be infused in communications. And um, so that's who I'd be looking to work with on something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was just curious too, just for the listening audience, you know, how whether you take something like that on internally or externally, you know, you could audit because you could grab all your things internally. But then mm -hmm. when you're sitting so far inside of it, it's it's hard to see what you can't see anymore. Exactly. When you've been, um, and then role of social. Yes, uh, I've had so many conversations about this. It's such a sticky, slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah, these, you're right. I mean, to all the points you made, there are a lot of, is it brand tarnishing? Are you promoting something you don't believe in? Are you continuing to add to these systemic problems by being there? But then it's also become the mass media right. channel because it's who watches channel five news at a certain time now because you've got everything's broken up by whatever app you're using through your TV and radio is not as popular. So it it, it is a slippery slope to see something coming. I don't know. I've fully figured it out. One thing I've, between what you had said about community in person and then where I think some of these social channels are going is like the revival of online community as a separate aspect of social media where yeah. it's not just a blast out. Like you're in this because you, you care about it. You care about this information. You might be silent, but you're really there for a reason. Maybe there's some type of gatekeeping to get into the community. Because right. it's being curated and they could still be very big, you know, and I've seen studies that talk about on Facebook in particular, it's it's those community groups that have really still been very successful for it. I've written slightly about it. I should I should keep writing more. I just I really think the moment of community is coming back and w yeah. we have a chance to start shaping that now. Um, and how do you do it in a non-exclusive way, I guess, that you're, you're getting all the right folks within the community. But then, you know, as, if there's fundraisers listening, I can imagine they're like, oh my God, but I just need those eyeballs. There's more people out there. And if it's in the community, it's locked and they already know about me. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, they've got us over a barrel. There's a lot now, going on there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, how do you, <laughs> how do you sell to your board? Oh, we're leaving social media, you know, like it's a hard it's a hard sell because they that is where people get their information where you can do that community building in a very effective way but you're always going to have this this feeling of conflict we completely stopped uh doing paid ads across social but especially on facebook after after everything that's happened the last couple of years um first of all they made it very difficult for nonprofits to boost their ads because mm. of the kinds of um, filters that they had to put on because of what was happening with the election. They had a lot of, they would pick up your content as being political and then they wouldn't be able to boost it. Even if it was just talking about, you know, food access or something like that, it would get flagged. Um, but, but the flip side to it is that they've created this algorithm where you have to pay to get it in front of any, anybody. So if you say, right. hey, we're only going to do organic, you might not reach anybody. So they really, they do have us in a really tough position, but I cannot, I, I really don't feel that it would be an ethical move for us to use foundation funds to pay Facebook for something. I, it's, it's a really sticky situation. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I feel it for you on that one. It's uh I think we need more conversations about that in 2023 in the nonprofit sector. I also really firmly believe a lot of the the work with data equity needs to start coming from the nonprofit sector too. It's the place where we need to lead because to your earlier point, the businesses are going to use all this data any way they want to make an extra buck and market better to you. Right. But we, we have very different needs and, and we do care about vulnerable populations and we do want to do it right. And so I, I feel like we have to step up as a sector to find the ways to do this because it's not going to come from i don't think it's going to come from the government that we they didn't do much during the pandemic i don't know where they're going to evolve anywhere else from there 
yeah so uh, these are things that i'm I'm definitely looking at in 2023 thank you so much for everything today this has been an awesome episode oh i'm so glad to hear that i've had a great time i really appreciate the opportunity now for everyone who has been a regular listener of the show you know we do always end with the same question uh and so today i'd like to know uh carrie what is your go-to song when you need a boost and why so, such a great question, and I gave it a lot of thought because my kids monopolize my phone for songs, and so I opened, uh, you know, my Google Music, and the top played album was the Minion soundtrack. So I had to, you know, I had to give it some real thought because that wasn't going to work. But um, I, I always go back to Florence and the Machine, the song um, "Shake It Out." It's just. Like, I know it's been around for a couple of years and it's a little cheesy, but I absolutely love it. And um, I guess it's just that, you know, the idea that that our times are coming and that's been a really helpful message over the last couple of years. So that's my, that's my go-to. Well, thank you for sharing that. We're going to get that into the Spotify list. Uh, I do love Florence and the Machine too. With everything uh, coming up to the year-end close, I hope it all goes smoothly for you and you're able to get some great times with your family and wish you you all the best of good health, happiness, and continued success in the new year. Thank Thank you you so much, Tony. You too. Well, thank you for sharing with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. And I'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, bye now.